<clears throat> Greetings, YouTube. Today I'll be doing a review of the Mutant Beastary 1 for the Mutant Epoch tabletop adventure role-playing game um, by William McOslin. So I'd like to be above board. I received this as a free review copy. <clears throat> so this is, in essence, a monster manual. Or, probably more appropriately, a mutant man uh, manual. Um, you have um, some excellent art in this book. Start off with a nice table of contents. I always like a good table of contents. Um, I find them uh, indispensable. Then we have a nice little introduction, and then we get into the mutants themselves. Um, and the illustrations, um, by and large, are excellent. Some of them are slightly not safe for work. Um, there are some, for example, there are memories present in a number of the illustrations. But, you know, that is... Uh, acceptable to me. I am an adult. And one of the nice things about this is that, for example, these are armadillos. Um, you have three different varieties. You have normal, spiny, and great. And then you have the stat blocks, which are appropriate to the Mutant Epoch game. And I like the fact that the statistics are all nice and clear. I always seem to have a hard time finding the statistics in, like, for example, Pathfinder and 3.5 monster blocks. I've never been able to figure out why I have a hard time finding them, but I always do. These are very clear. Um, one of the things I like is that you have the morale written right in here. So you have poor, average, and firm. Um, you have the size, uh, in this case length, because it is a quadruped. Um, one meter, 2.2 meters, and 4.2 meters. It's a very large armadillo. One meter, to my mind, is a little bit long, unless you're going considering the overall body length, including the tail then you've got a meter, because an armadillo isn't quite that large. But if you're including the overall body length with the tail, you're good to go. Um, then they have um, your weight, which is nice. And one thing I like is they've written right in here, you have a percentage chance of mutation, how many mutations there are. So in this case, it's a 39% chance of getting one to two mutations. In this case, for the spiny, there is a 9% chance of one mutation. And the uh, great ones seem to have a great deal of genetic stability. They don't have any chance at all of, uh, of mutations. I find it interesting, why 39 and why 9? If, if the author can tell me well, how he arrived at some of these numbers, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, but they, one of the things I like is they put the mutation chart here. So for normal mutation, normal armadillos that have mutations, you roll a die 20 in here, and then you check on this, for example, it could be venomous with a type B death poison. It could be two-headed. Um, which gives you a plus five um, for strike and a plus two damage. So that's that, that kind of thing. Uh, here we have an image of a spiny armadillo, and then we have the image of the giant armadillo, which is, in my opinion, completely appropriate as far as size is concerned because it's very reminiscent of the Glyptodon. Um, we have um, badgers. The battle apes I find quite interesting because the idea of using genetically modified apes as workers or as combat troops is right out of uh, Planet of the Apes and makes perfect sense in a world where genetic uh, mutations are, genetic manipulation is available and a, a core part of, uh, for example, the GURPS book Biotech, excellent resource, though my real experience with that is with the first edition, the, I, guess was, I guess which was the third an iteration of the game, maybe second. But then again, nice stat blocks. We have a wild chimp, a cybernetic chimp, a wild gorilla, and a cybernetic gorilla. Now, here we have a nice illustration of a chimp quadruped uh, movement holding a branch, something that chimps do in the real world. Then we have, they talk about the different kind of mutations they can get in here, and they talk about how, which kind of um, cybernetics these things have if they are being produced by. Uh, um, enclaves that have that ability. Here we have another nice illustration of a mutant gorilla, uh, and again in a nice quadruped stance. Now, here we have the first illustration that I was scratching my head a little bit because chimps and gorillas are knuckle walkers. There's, there's no knuckle here. Now, I'm not saying that chimps and gorillas that have been cybernetically enhanced for combat shouldn't have built in weapons. They should. I think it's cool. But they should be built on top of or under or inside an arm. There needs to be a hand here because they're knuckle walkers. Another example of the same problem is here. 
Again, they're knuckle walkers. That animal has now been crippled because it can't walk on its knuckles. Nice illustration, don't get me wrong, that's beautiful artwork. Kudos, but I did question that. Um, then we have beavers. My wife found the tusked beaver illustration quite humorous. Um, then we have some, uh, just some weird mutations, like this creature obviously designed at some point by somebody to have like human brains running this battle droid, essentially, but it's just purely organic. Um, and we have some freaky mutations that are, it's more tail than, uh, than, than, than humanoid now, very reminiscent of a naga. Um, a bog lurker, um, big chitinous, vicious creature. The brain hound, covered in eyes, which was very twisted. Um, uh, a bug crit, genetically engineered insects that have gone very wrong. When don't genetically engineered creatures go very long in these in these uh, in these storylines? We have a type of crustacean. We have a whole bus section on cat, so they have. That isn't much of a cat-like thing anymore. Um, humanoid versions thereof, uh, or roughly humanoid, with very large sickled claws. This is called a cough jaw. I gotta tell you, I think this one's a little silly, but that's just me. That may fit your campaign well. Um, Creeping Impaler, that's a nice name. Uh, Crimson Slinker, a whole section on crustaceans, and crustaceans are good. Crustaceans have natural armor. And because they have a short life cycle, it makes sense that they are highly mutated and there should be multiple varieties therein. Um, we have a Desi Roller, which made me think of a Beholder. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, then we have um, a Deep Kin, which is a variety of, uh, of, of human. Um, then we have a species of deer, and again, deer have short lifespan. There are many species in North America. It makes sense that there's more than a, a number of different stat blocks to play with. Um, and that's a nice mutant version thereof. It's kind of cool. Um, we have Devilkins, and again, varieties of humans. Um, a section on dogs, too, because there was another section of dogs in the original game. Um, this jaw structure here, to me, would seem to be less efficient than two heads. I think two heads makes more sense than this, so I think that would actually not work well. I think it would actually put the creature at a genetic disadvantage, but, you know... And this is, of course, very, va barely vaguely even dog-like any longer, but still quite interesting. I like the jaw structure on that one. It was a domal goth. I like the jaw structure, jaw structure on that one. <clears throat> then we have an entropy beast, which can throw spikes and has tentacles and and uh, and claws. Very, very nasty. Um, a, um, an epochian merfolk. So we have. A mermaid versions of, of, of humanoids in the in the world. We have a fetid old tuck. That's not pleasant looking. Uh, we have an aquatic creature, which I got to tell you, it, it looks a little silly to me. <laughs> but sometimes things don't look as menacing as you might think they they should. Here we have jelloids. So you have these like almost single giant single celled creatures, and this can be reminded me of stuff right out of 1950s era. Science fiction movies. That's cool. And then we have a number of goats, which again, uh, there are a number of those species in the in, in America now. And it makes sense that we have mutant varieties in the future. And we have a hell crawler, which is this strange amalgamation of it absorbs people and then consumes them slowly, and then goes out and hunts for more, which is very, very creepy. It makes me think of the aboleth in some um, uh, manner. Um, then we have. Uh, this is a large section, because so a whole bunch of stats on this particular creature. Um, then we have a possum. We have a hooked nasher, a gasher, a horrid slicer. Um, we have a hyena sapien, so fusions of human and, and, uh, and hyenas, which is kind of interesting. Then we have this. I looked at this illustration. I'm going, that's a sturge. That's a straight-up D&D sturge. Made me smile. Um... And we have a section on insects, and, and it makes sense that we have many insects. This is the second section um, of very available of them because, again, short lifespans, lots of varieties. We're ignoring the fact that insects can't be this large. Um, this is a science fantasy game, so we're going to let that slide. Um, lots of insects in here, and again, that makes perfect sense. There should be lots of varieties. There are a large number of them in the real world. And we have a junk stalker, which is very, very big. Um, 
a weird creature, which makes me think of some kind of demon. Um, uh, okay, not more uh, uh, humanoid animal types, which I happen to be a big fan of anthros. We have marmots, which made me smile. Um, marmots that can be dangerous, and mice that can be dangerous also made me smile. Um, millipedes, they make a nice addition to the game. Very creepy looking. Um, mollusks, and the mollusks are quite interesting. I think that he did a nice job with these. The Nightwing, which is a humanoid bat. Um, uh, otters, and they can be fierce hunters. Uh, it makes perfect sense that you got lots of pigs. Pigs are dangerous in and of themselves, although so mutant pigs. Um, a type of uh, large humanoid, the Pit Jacker. So we have the Pit Jacker, which is a terrifying creature. Uh, four arms, multiple eyes, very reminiscent of uh, ogres. Um, here we have plants, and it makes perfect sense that we have multiple plants. This is plants two, because there were plants in the um, original game as well. Um, then we have some pun ghouls, which makes me think of something right out of Celtic mythology. Um, porcupines, I kind of like, like that they were involved in there, added in there. We have a thing called a promothum. Prothemus. Yeah, Prothemus. I haven't said these things out loud before. I apologize. Um, rabbits. And that right there is something straight out of Gamma World. Um, lots of different rabbits. Maybe we have a rocket raccoon. We have mutant raccoons. We have a freaky creature that reminds me of one of the brain devourer, I think, from D&D. Then we have the saber gut with a strange intestine-like weapon with a saber at the end. Um, and we have the Sagaroth which is this huge creature, much taller than a human, uh, doesn't move a whole lot, very powerful scion. Um, so they, they use their mental abilities to enslave humanity, um, which is always thrilling. Then we have a saw wing, and the saw wing to my mind, that these look like they would snap off. I would probably just have them having edges on their wings that were dangerous, um, but articulated so they could fold their wings up. I, just, I think personally that that's just asking to be busted, but that's just me. Then we have another type of uh, mutant humanoid, the Scrags. We have mutant sheep. Very important. Lots of sheep in the world. And if you've ever seen the movie Black Sheep, very appropriate. Then we have Skinners, which remind me of Reavers from Firefly. Mutant Skunks. Sky Demons, which are kind of freaky looking. Um, I don't know how these four wings would function. I really don't. I think the ones that are vertical would get in the way of <coughs> getting it uh, flying, but maybe they, someone else can tell me if that would work. We have mutant slugs, which is cool. I like the mutant slugs. We have a snagger, which looks like just like death on two legs, or technically four legs, I guess. Um, snails, which was very reminiscent of the classic giant snail, flail snail from uh, from D&D. Um, that's Fiend Folio, I believe. Um, then we have uh, the Soul Leech, which is a Lovecraftian horror, if there ever was one. Um, the Spike Blade Mutant Squirrels, which is cool to see mutant squirrels being dangerous. And we have a creature that, for no other way of putting this, has a penis which fires rocks. That's just a little twisted. And we have a, tail, a Tall Clipper, which is, again, more makes me think of uh, demonic creatures. And uh, then we have... Uh, Terra fins, which are essentially land sharks. I mean, they're fish, but not, not sharks, but they're based on trouts, I believe. Um, tree squid, and my wife loved this illustration. She thought this illustration was just wonderful, and I have to agree with her. Very, very creepy, and uh, just ex excellently. Maybe the best illustration in, in the entire book. Um, then we have turtles, which is nice, because turtles are cool. They're very dangerous. I've used them before. And mutant turtles, which I love the anthros. There's a very large turtle, reminiscent of a dragon turtle. Um, here we have the Underfoot, a race of uh, mutant humans that would like to think of themselves as the next stage in our evolution. And they're willing to wipe us out to prove it. Um, then we have the Walking Hook Fiends. Um, the Waste Stalker, which is strange double-clawed kind of jaw-like things on its, on its arms. Weasels, which are dangerous, and large ones would be more so. Then we have a Weasel Hydra. I think there was a giant weasel in Horse Clan. Someone can tell me if I'm correct in that belief or not. Then we have mutant whales, mutant Dalton, dolphins, mutant whales, and mutant baleen whales. Uh, sorry, mutant killer whales. The killer whales and baleen whales, which could also be used just for large whales. Um, another race of anthros, the wolfer. 
and a dog-like variety thereof. Um, wolverines, which is cool because they're dangerous. Um, and we have another freaky looking creature here known as the Zalsh Mal or Mai. I can't quite tell. I'm in a hurry. Sorry. Um, lots of mutations, lots of abilities. They're quite dangerous. And this creature reminds me of something out of a video game I saw recently. I can't remember when I saw a playthrough on D&D, uh, on, on YouTube, and it just it reminded me of it. But I like the illustration. It's uh, very creepy. And then, we, of course, we have a, uh, a wonderful selection of encounter charts and then some ads at the end. So, I consider this to be a must-have if you are a person that owns the Mutant Epoch game and are a fan of the of that system. I also think it has a great deal of utility if you were just going to run a post-apocalyptic game um, because I think that this would give you lots of inspiration. Does it have any problems? Well, it is kind of grimdark. There is a lot of slavery of the gener generic variety and of the sexual slavery variety in this book. I think that it would have been better off if they had implied some of these things as opposed to being explicit about them, the fact that these things actually exist. There's also a slant for the fact that if you're not attractive, you get eaten, and if you're attractive, you get kept as a sex slave. And to my mind, that's a little problematic. Um, I think that is, is talking about some appearance issues and things, which I don't necessarily know if I want to see in a game I'm running. But that's just me. These are things I can gloss over. These are things I don't need to uh, need to worry about. I can just ignore them. But some people may feel, because it's in the book, that they should in in intentionally include it. And I think you definitely should look at this and decide, do I want to have these rather grimdark um, aspects in it, or do I want to have um, dial that back down and try to have some more normalized relations between some of these creatures and the human survivors of the world, the mutant survivors of the world. Um, another thing is there's a lot of apex hunters in here, a lot of apex predators. There's no way you could have all these creatures in one environment. You would have to spread them out and have them definitely be over a large area because there just isn't enough animal mass on the continent to have this many apex predators in one tight location. So you're going to have to spread them out. There's no way you're getting around that. So you could like base your campaign over around one or two of them. And if the player characters moved to a new area, then you could introduce more of these creatures. But I don't see any way you could put these all in one area. There's just too many of them. And many of them are consumers of humanoids. Um, but it's an excellent book. Incredible artwork. Just that tree squid, I think, is the best in the book. Um, and uh, definitely something that I think every person that loves a good uh, post-apocalyptic setting is going to love.